Excellent. So our first one, once again, even though we have the defined decimal, it's 5,300. Because the rules for adding, you look at the number past the decimal. Now this one, even though it doesn't have a decimal, we add them together because the rule says it's expressed with the number past the decimal. You round to it. So it ends up being 5,300. Here, did Simon do this? Yeah. You've got none past the decimal right here. So you're going to round to 818. So this should be 818. So Zane, with number four, how many true numbers do you see here? There are three true numbers there. How many do you see here? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Alex? There's one. So your answer must have how many? One. So the five, you're going to round this, but if you look here, is that odd or even? Seven odd or even? It's odd, so you're going to round up, right? So this is going to end up being 80. So the new figures you see in this top number? Six. There's six. How many do you see in the bottom number? One. One. So your answer must have how many? One. Must have one because of the two. So what are you going to round that to? Yes, you're going to round it to 200. Because you have six true numbers on the top number and you have one on the bottom. So whenever you multiply and divide, you're always going to find the weakest and circle it, just like I did here. And then you're going to express the weak in your answer. So the weak is one, so the answer must have one. So you're gonna round this, it's a seven, and round that to two. So it's gonna end up being 200, no decimal, because then you have one place. Meters cross out, the answer is 200. Nice job. Anybody want to do number two? All right, go ahead, uh, Vance. All right, excellent. Now, in the textbook, the addition and subtraction rules say when you add or subtract measurements, the answer must have the same number of digits to the right of the decimal as the original value, having the fewest number of digits to the right of the decimal. So the problem here is that there's no decimal here, right? So the definition in the book needs to be modified to say really to the right of the first whole number. Because if you round these numbers here, there's no decimal there. Now if you place a decimal, you're saying you've counted them, so you're changing the value of the number. So the rule needs to be modified to say that to the right of the first whole number. Zero is a whole number. You didn't know that? It is a whole number. So both of them are 5,300, but as we progress, they will make those modifications because if you start putting decimals here, you know, you. These are, these are different. 5,000 without a decimal is saying anywhere from 4,500 to 5,500, right? And this is saying anywhere from uh, 250 to 350. And it's the range. And then if you say now the answer is 5,300, there's a big difference between a number that was not specifically counted, that was rounded, and the one that has specifically been counted. This basically says, one answer only, right? So I do think the book needs to be modified a little bit to say to the right of the first whole number. Otherwise, you are changing the significance of the number. Right, number four?
Hi, Tamara. Okay, so if you look at the first number, how many true, true uh, significant figures do you see? Yeah, there's three here. Does everybody see there's three here? How many do you have in this number? One. So the rules say the answer must only have one. So you have to round this to where you have only one true number. So what's it going to be? One significant digit. Okay, you can't change the answer from 75 to 750. That's too much of a change. So if you, the rule says if there's a 5, the number in front is 7, even or odd? Odd. Uh, so you're going to round up to 80 meters. And when you multiply a meter times a meter, what's it? Meets meter squared. So length times width is like an area, so you're squaring that. Don't forget to do that. Everybody see why we did that? Does that make sense? Any questions? So this is true or significant, this is not, because we rounded it. See where we rounded it? Yeah. And we based it on this number. It takes a little bit of practice to get used to this. I mean, we could do this for like probably two weeks, and you'd still probably struggle it on it because you're not used to doing it. it. usually takes 21 days to get a habit. The lab, OB Certainer, this is from the Lab Aids, it's the student guide and worksheet. All science is an attempt to understand and explain the world we live in. Investigators, scientists, and researchers have sought to explain the incredible amount of phenomena, phenomena that makes up our world. Despite the incredible amount and variety of research, these specialists use a universal approach to scientific problems. Often, this process is referred to as a scientific method. The scientific me method involves recognizing the existence of a problem, accumulating data, forming tentative hypotheses, and controlling experimentation. Results and conclusions should be consistent and verifiable by other scientists and investigators. Once an explanation is assumed, a model representing a theory can be created. This model may change over time as a result of additional experimentation and research. For example, the model of the universe espoused by the Greeks and Arabs showed Earth as the center. Later in the 17th century, Copernicus and Galileo proposed a model that showed the sun as the center with Earth and the other planets revolving around it. This process took about 2,000 years. However, in recent times, we are constantly revising this model to include more information involving actual shape and numbers of moons and planets as a result of technological advances that allow us to more directly observe our universe. In this lab aids kit, you will be observing and experimenting with an object that is specific design and style. You will not be able to see this design or configuration, so your observ observations will be indirect. These indirect observations will involve your other senses. In order to solve the following problem, you need to be patient, use all of your concentration, be alert to detail, and show in ingenuity. Excellent. Very good. So you got one that was close? Yeah, I guess half of it was that's cool. All, right. All the other ones were way off. All the other ones were way off? Yeah. All right. <laughs> you can do one at a time, or you can grab some. It's really up to you. Well, right now you have three circles on there. You have the first one, which is student A. You're going to draw what you think. The second one is student B, and the third one is what the actual model looks like. So you'll take the tape off and you'll see what it actually looks like. If you have three in your group because of the class size, just draw another circle and put student C. Does that make sense? Okay, so when you come tomorrow, these four questions will be your bell work. And it comes out of chapter three, going into matter. And we learn in the introduction chapter that chemistry is a study matter, right? So matter is very important to us. Matter is associated with time since matter is needed to calculate time. You have to have matter to calculate time. 
and time is mathematically defined as the following time, distance, divided by velocity. So when you go into physics, you'll start calculating some of that. So a substance must be moving to calculate time. If you don't have a substance moving, you can't calculate any time. Like little cars moving, right? Substance. Now the Big Bang states that no matter existed before it occurred. So there was no matter. Actually, it says it was emptiness. We'll talk more about that later. So time did not exist. And the Big Bang states that time began around 13.8 billion years ago. So this is the most common you know, theory in science right now. We've got the whole chronological list of all the theories dating back to the 15th century BC. And we'll talk more about those as we read through them tomorrow and next Tuesday, because we got Labor Day off. Um, so you'll need to look on the internet for these, the four points. There are four points. I didn't give them to you because you need to do a little bit of you know, research on your own to know what the four points are. So we'll list them tomorrow for bellwork points. And then we're going to do this little airplane activity. Now this will be another lab grade this week. You are going to build an airplane. Now these instructions say you're going to do it ten times. You're going to throw it ten times. And it says you're limited to the size of this paper. I'm going to change that a little bit so you have your own procedure. You're going to write the airplane, how you built it, on the lab write-up. And then you're going to get three attempts to throw the airplane from the farthest distance. I have a measuring device that will measure in meters. It has to be an airplane. You can't ball a piece of paper to throw it. It's going to be an airplane. So you get three attempts. And once you have your procedure completed, you'll hand this to me, you'll do your attempts, I'll write down what your longest is, we'll circle it, and then whoever gets the longest airplane throw gets 10 points extra credit. So instead of getting like 100, you can get 110 out of 100. I'm only going to reward the best. How, like anything bigger than the paper? Yeah. How much bigger? Uh, you can make it as big as you want. I really, really? as long as it's paper, right? It has to be paper. That's fine. As long as we look at it and we can all say that that's paper. Now, if it's cardboard, uh, it's still paper. It's going to be heavy. Uh, I'll, I'll probably agree with that, too. As long as you can record the procedure of how you made it, then I'll, I'll go along. Because that's part of the um, experiment is knowing how to write a procedure. And this really gives you the opportunity to do that. So if you want to start on this tonight because you want to win, that's okay. Now, if you want to come in tomorrow and work on it, last moment, we'll see who wins, all right?